This is the tabernacle, a church of imperfect people doing our best to love God, love people, and make disciples. My name is Ben, and I'm one of the pastors. Today we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is probably one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Many people who've never been around church have heard this story about a young man and somebody much bigger than him and the battle that took place in between them. We're talking, of course, about David and Goliath. So if you've got a Bible or an app, I'd encourage you to open up and follow along. There's a lot in there. We're going to do our best to take the lessons that apply to us. And, uh, you know, there might be some more for you to discuss in your small group or fight club uh, or tab women group later on during the week. So we're going to get right after it. Let's do this. Welcome uh, again to the Tabernacle. I'm glad you made it this weekend, wherever you're at, whether it's here in Buckley, uh, in Manistee, in Manistee County, or if you're listening or watching, 20 years from now, like it's a time capsule, stranded forever on the worldwide interwebs. Thanks for uh, tuning in with us. Uh, and I want to uh, say a special thank you uh, for those of you this week in 2021 who spent some time praying uh, for uh, this church's staff and ministry leaders. We've spent the last week in kind of a spiritual emphasis week. Uh, yes, you can work on a staff and not really emphasize spiritual things a lot. You can get caught up in the humdrum of just doing the job. But we took um, some concerted time together um, all this week, and God really moved in some powerful ways. So thank you for those who saw the message and prayed for us. Um, that was really cool, and it's much appreciated. Jesus said that if you uh, strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep are scattered. And so that's why we did that, is as under shepherds, as ministry leaders, it's important for us to make sure that this is right all the time. And so we don't want to take that for granted. Uh, so if you have a Bible, if you go ahead and open it to 1 Samuel, does anyone know where we are? Where, where, where are we at in this story? Can somebody help me out? Okay, David and Goliath. Come on. It's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's probably the most well-known part of 1 Samuel, probably the most well-known duel in human history, right? We've all heard the story of David and Goliath. Books have been written about David and Goliath. David and Goliath gets quoted all the time, even by people who don't even believe in God or the Bible, this epic story of... Uh, a boy, or as we'll find out, maybe a young man defeating a giant with impossible odds, right? What does God have in there for us? So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 17, and it's a long chapter with a lot of really good details. And all of the details are pretty precise, which I believe lend to the authenticity of the story. So this isn't a story about Ulysses or Agamemnon. This is not a myth. This is historical fact, and the precise attention to details was so good, I thought about, oh, can I summarize some of it? Nope, it's a long chapter, and we're going to read all of it. <laughs> so buckle up, uh, let's go, and uh, we'll, we'll take a few breaks in here and see if we can't um, see it and smell it and touch it and maybe make it come alive for us. So starting in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succoth and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. 
And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, approximately nine and a half feet in American. Thanks. Some of you got that. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed. And greatly afraid. And so we'll pause right there. Uh, we have a champion of Gath. It says he was a giant. He was over nine feet tall, right? According to a cubit and a span. And he had all this heavy armor. And, and you know, there's debate about how big this guy was, but we believe he was a descendant of the Anakim. Remember when the children of Israel came into Israel, they had to drive out the sons of Anak, these giants, right? He was a big dude. And so just to make sure, some guys got together and they got a weaver's beam. And, and at the Creation Museum, uh, someone actually donated this. This is what the spear would have looked like. Now, that's not Goliath. That's, I don't even know who that guy is, right? I don't know his name. Uh, he doesn't have a very good haircut, but whatever. You know, he's a good guy. He's working at the Creation Museum. And uh, uh, that's how big Goliath's spear would have been. All these details about how big the spear was, how much his armor weighed, and what he's done is this guy comes down with that spear, which, as you could see, you have to be a pretty big guy to be able to even throw that. He strikes fear in the people of Israel because these armies are camped out on these mountains that, with a valley in between, so they each hold the high ground. No one wants to uh, risk it by going into the valley, so they're in a standoff. Well, a frequent ancient tactic would be to send a champion. Hey, let's prevent some bloodshed. Here's our guy. You send your guy. Here's our guy. He's a giant. This is his spear. Come face us. Winner takes all. A fight to the death. And it says, all Israel, including their spirit-less king, Saul, trembled. They trembled. So back to the story. Verse 12. It says, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. Remember, we met all of these last week in chapter 16. They're reintroducing David, the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Verse 14, David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. 
And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. And so what we have here is both armies, as I said, have drawn up at this location, which you can still go to today. This is the Valley of Elah, where there's a valley running through the middle of two mountain ranges. And what we believe is the Philistines were invading now, and they're driving north from uh, uh, outside of Israel into the heart of Judah. And Israel's fighting this losing battle. And when they finally got to a place of high ground, that's why they find themselves in this standoff. And the interesting little details, it's not the main part of the story, but it's interesting for us, is we find that David, even though he's the youngest, he's actually serving in the military like his three oldest brothers. Remember, there's eight of them total. In chapter 16, seven brothers were paraded in front of the prophet Samuel. And every time Samuel said, no, this is not the one, this is not the one, this is not the one, don't you have any left? And God had said to him, none of these are to be the next king. And Jesse said, yes, there's one more, the youngest, the shepherd. These are his, remember, he's got the crap job out there in the, out there in the boonies, you know, and they had to bring him in and he's anointed king. So we have the three oldest sons and the youngest son. And remember, David is an armor bearer. And again, it's not worth fighting about, but I don't believe David was a young boy. I believe this puts David's age somewhere between 18 to his mid-20s. Because you, according to uh, the book of uh, Numbers, you had to be 20 years or older to even serve in the Israel's military. But regardless, he's going back and forth. So he's doing his armor bear duties and aide de camp to Saul. He's getting a crash course in the way the, the, the king's court works and the way the military works. But he's also going home to tend the sheep and bring some food for his older brothers. Does that make sense? And so we have this place, the Valley of Elah, which is Elah's basically means an oak, a, a certain type of oak that uh, uh, grew, grew there, and that's what it was named for. And so we come to verse 24. It says, All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that's Goliath, they fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So this is interesting to me. This is just, and again, this isn't what the main thrust of it is about, but I didn't want to preach on 1 Samuel 17 for 18 weeks, which we could, but we're not going to do that, right? But David has come down and he's hearing the threats and there's something in David that is angered by this. It's a righteous anger. Remember in chapter 16, verse 13, the Spirit of God had rushed upon David. And in 16, 14, we find out that the Spirit of God had departed from Saul. So the Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity that's empowering, that's enabling. As he's growing up, he has the Spirit right now and there's something in him that's angry. Who is this who defies The armies of the one true living God. 
So they're telling him, oh, David, I'm glad you're here, man. You want to hear? Look at this. This is this big guy, and, and, and we don't have a champion, and no one will fight him. And we find out that Saul, whom the spirit has departed from, he's not the champion. He's trying to bribe others to go be the champion. Hey, if you go out there and you beat this giant, I'm going to give you my daughter in marriage, and you're going to live tax-free for the rest of your life. Sounds pretty good in 2021 America, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and then there's his brother. I wonder what kind of house they lived in after David was anointed king. There's a little resentment there. Does that remind you of some other Bible stories? Remember the sons of Jacob? Remember the youngest, Joseph, or one of the youngest at the time, Joseph, and the elder brothers that resented him? You see how this kind of, eh, that's a different sermon. It's interesting that David says, what did I do now? What is it now? I just asked a question. So he turns away from his brother, who's almost mocking him, right? So this is to set up the story that no one was like, oh, David's here. He's just a bystander. He's a nobody. To everyone but God, he's the most unlikely. So we pick it up in 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul. Remember, he's the king. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there was a lion or a bear he, and, and, and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, this is just incredible because he's the armor bearer. He's obviously a youth. And by the way, youth can mean, in, in, at least as my understanding with this translation, like I said, in, anywhere from 18 to your mid-20s. You're but a youth. You're a rookie. You're an amateur. You don't have old man strength yet. You haven't grown into your man's body yet. You haven't been a warrior long enough. You can't beat this guy. But there was something, and I believe it was God's spirit in David that convinced Saul. Because David starts talking about killing lions and bears and how God helped him do that before. By the way, it wasn't a lion or a bear. It was lions and bears. That's why I said last week, I believe time has passed. Because none of that is about David. By David's own mouth, all of that was about God. There's a little foreshadowing here. Don't put David too high up on a pedestal. First Samuel will disappoint you. And if it doesn't, second Samuel will for sure disappoint you right? He says, it was the Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear. And so Saul says, go. Verse 38, then Saul clothed David with his armor and put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. One of the interesting things is I've never been there, but I uh, uh, am told that if you travel to the Valley of Elah during the winter months, during the fall, winter, and early spring months, you can still see the brook where David would have taken the stones from. There's a brook there that dries up in summer, 
and there's ample stones that are available. And David has, has been, you know, he's convinced Saul with God's help, let me be the champion. And this is just bizarre because here's a giant, an experienced warrior that uh, could rip us in half and we're going to send out this youth. But there was something in him, like I said, I believe it was a spirit. And Saul relents and says, go, go represent us, but you better take armor. Now, it doesn't say that the armor was too heavy. It says it was untested. He was an armor bearer. He wasn't an, armory, or an armor wearer. That just happened. I don't know where that came from, right? I didn't plan that one. And, and, and so he's like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this. And so now he goes in in just his clothes with a staff, with a sling, five stones. Now, I've, I've had some people and I've heard some sermons, some well-meaning sermons about, you know what the five stones were for? You know, uh, I think we can have a lot of theories. You know, I've heard that he had five brothers. I heard, well, that was because David, you know, there was the five moons of, I don't know, whatever. You know, there's always something. I think he just wanted a full magazine. I think he wanted a full magazine. And so uh, he gets these stones out of the brook and uh, this is big. You feel the drama build? Verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. So there's a guy in front of him holding his shield. That's how big this guy is. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. This sounds like an MMA brawl. Just so all the smack talk going down, right? Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it. And struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. And he fell on his face to the ground. Short battle. The preamble was longer than the battle. The smack talk was longer than the battle. And it's amazing, but it's not impossible. It's amazing, but not impossible. One of the reasons that I wanted to show pictures and the sermon this week, and this is a Palestinian uh, using the type of sling that David used, the exact same type of sling. One of the reasons that I've used photographs is sometimes we as Christians, when we read the Bible, it becomes this, like this other world fantasy world, right? And we read it in such a way that, oh, well, you know, they probably embellish some things and we read it like we would the Lord of the Rings. Friends, there were no orcs. There were no hobbits. It's not Narnia with centaurs and minotaurs and Mr. Tumnus. This really happened. This really happened. And we don't need to embellish it. We don't need to make David out to be six. He was just a thick year old boy. Yeah, that's what he was. No, he was probably a dude. They weren't complete idiots. Oh, let's send a six-year-old in a pull-up out there. No, we're not doing that. No. He was an older teen or early 20s, he was, but it was still enough to doubt his ability. And yes, he took a sling, and that's not impossible. 
I had, the, I had the privilege one time, I was, at a, I was speaking at a camp in Georgia, and there was this guy there who had just come back from the Holy Land, and he bought a sling just like this. And it was just he and I were goofing around. There was a break in the day. We're standing by a lake, and he goes, dude, you want to try it? I go, absolutely, I want to try it. I've been hearing these stories since I was a small kid. I want to try this. We were chucking like golf ball-sized rocks as far as I can hit a golf ball. And when I'm not rusty, I can hit a golf ball pretty far right? You get, the, you get that rock inside the pouch and you get it going and you can go this way, you can go this way, you can get it going this way. When you let it go, the end of the leather snaps like the crack of a whip because at the tip of that force, it's faster than the speed of sound. A Palestinian sling can chuck a projectile a hundred miles per hour plus. That'll kill a man. In fact, Today, I'm told in Israel, if you're caught chucking stones with a sling, that's jail time. It's an illegal weapon. And I'm, talk- I'm not talking a couple days. I'm talking you can do 10 years for having a sling and using it. And so if you think about it, David faced off against the giant with a superior weapon system. Or at least one he was familiar with. That's on one level. He's not going to grapple with Goliath. He's not going to, hey, let's get in and trade some. He's going to stand far off and snipe him. But there was something else. There was something else. More, more important, right? Spirit of God. Spirit of God. And it's important because my whole life, this story was about David. And it's really not. It was how big Goliath was. And it's really not. The spirit, 1 Samuel 16, 13, had rushed upon David from that time forward. And it was the spirit of God on David. Did you hear it in all the words? All the words, the things that he said? You come at me with sword, and with a spear and a javelin. I come to you in the name of Jesse. Nope. In the name of King Saul. Nope. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. It's not about the Philistines and Israel. It's not about Goliath versus Saul or Goliath versus David. They were defying God himself. Even in the smack talk, (laughs) Goliath's all about, I'm going to feed you to the beasts. And David's, uh, no, I'm going to do this. What does he say? That all the earth, think about that, may know that there is a God in Israel. You know how many times this story has been told? How many thousands of years to every corner of the world? Not to see how great David is. To know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly, all these armies on either side of the valley of Elah may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into my hand. David's going to sit there with a sling like that. Pop him in the forehead. And then he's going to go, well, let's keep reading the story. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David... Go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. 
And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. This is God's word. And I believe every bit of it to be true. And it's interesting. It's whenever we study scripture, those of you, I'm going to nerd out just for a second. Those of you that are going to dive into this at a fight club table or a women's Bible study or with your kids or want to under, every, understand every little detail, keep in mind a couple things. Last week I mentioned time passes through these things, right? So I believe right in the middle of 16 between David's anointing and him becoming an armor bearer that's playing the guitar for Saul, time has passed. But there's other opinions. Some people uh, would, would, would point out that the Bible isn't always perfectly chronological. And I only bring this up because it's like, wait a minute, Saul just had a conversation with David. Why is he saying, who is this young man? Is Saul, you know, losing his mind, his faculties? Well, that comes later. But right now, I don't believe that's what it is. I believe this entire story is chronological. That David is anointed, the Spirit comes on him, time passes during which he's a shepherd boy, worshiping God in the wilderness, killing lions and bears, just like the guy on a buffalo. You do not go there with me? Come on. That was random YouTube reference for you guys, and you left me hanging right there, that old row. But the Spirit's helping him, and then he becomes the armor bearer that's playing the music, and as he comes back, he steps up to be the champion. And I believe when Saul turns to Abner and goes, who is this guy? I believe it's dripping with suspicion. I think this is where the suspicion is birthed. Because remember, in 1613, that's chapter 1613, the Spirit of God had rushed upon David. And in 1614, it says, and the Spirit of God departed from Saul. And in those moments, there was a shift. And so now when Saul sees David doing what maybe Saul should have been doing, instead of hiding Instead of trying to bribe someone else to do the work. Here, carry my armor. Represent us. I think what was laced in that is, wait a minute. Who's this guy's dad again? He's saying, what's his family line? And to double check, David comes in after this picture with Goliath's head. Isn't this awesome? We had a, man, I want to play that movie. Walk in. What's up? You know? Hey, who's your daddy again? I'm David, son of Jesse from Bethlehem. Because remember, Jesse, a descendant of Boaz and Ruth, a descendant of Judah, a descendant of Jacob. And that's the line of blessing. So, this is the time where I start talking about how you can slay your giant with a little bit of faith. Nope. In fact, if you've ever heard a sermon that says, you're David, go slay the giant, wipe it from your memory. Because David's not the hero. He's not the hero. A couple words that come to my mind. Here's the first word. The word is defiance. Defiance. Over and over in this chapter, it says that Goliath came out to defy the armies of the Lord. He said, I defy you. David comes out and says, who is this that defies the armies of the Lord, of the living God? He says it again. He calls him the one true God. And I will defeat this that defies so that all the world may know that there's only one true God, and that all those amassed here will know. You see, Goliath was not just defying Israel. He wasn't just defying Saul. Because these are God's chosen, he's defying God himself. He's invaded this land, and it's defiance of God himself. 
We do the same thing. We do the same thing. If you've heard the gospel and you choose not to believe it, if you've heard the gospel and you choose not to become a worshiper of Jesus Christ, you are living and potentially dying in defiance of the one true God. And your fate will be no different than Goliath's will or the Philistines. You say, well, you know, I'm here at the tabernacle. I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. You know, you said the moment I become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live in me. That is true. But even as a Christian, you can live in defiance of the one true God. Oh, you're saved. In fact, this is what our staff spent all Thursday learning about is how the Holy Spirit works in us. Because you can have the Spirit. You can be a Christian, whether you're a student, whether you've been here forever or anywhere in between. Maybe you're just coming back to faith. Maybe you've been here the whole time and you never left. Even during COVID, you were showing up all by yourself. (laughs) To live in defiance of the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says that we we can grieve the Spirit and we can quench the Spirit. So the moment I become a Christian and receive Christ by faith, I am baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not out there looking for a second thing. It happens at the moment of faith, the moment of conversion. When you pass from death to life, you're adopted, you're a child of God. Are you with me, church? That's what the Bible teaches. And and you're transformed, you're sealed, and, and for all eternity, you're a child of God. However, as we talked about last week, I'm still in this human earth suit, my flesh. I still live in this dark world. Sometimes my will doesn't want to submit to the spirit that lives in me. Paul talked about this in Romans. This is raging war that's within us. And when I intentionally choose to sin, Scripture says that that grieves God. That grieves God. That saddens him. It doesn't hurt him. You can't hurt God, except for the fact that he chooses to let it grieve him. And the Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit is not a force. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit is fully God. And Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that when I willfully sin, I grieve the Spirit. And then there's other times that this preacher says no to God. I say no to God. I get the little tap on the shoulder, the little whisper, say that, give that, go there, stop this, whatever it is, the little nudge. And you don't have to be super Christian to feel that. All of us have felt it. We've been in a church service, you've been at a camp, you've been uh, sitting at your home or driving in your car or even at work, and all of a sudden you know that you know that you know that you're supposed to invite someone or share your faith or back off or say, boss, I don't think that's ethical, whatever it is. And when you say no to God... The scripture says that that's quenching the Holy Spirit. That's like taking this thing that the book of Acts described as a, as a flame of fire and you kind of put it out. Both of those are defiance of God. Now, wait a second. I thought we were supposed to be David in the thing and kill our giants. No, we might be acting like Philistines. I don't know. We might be acting like Goliath. I don't know. Think about the difference between David and Saul. Oh, David had grieved the Spirit, if you've been with our study. David has quenched the Spirit. Or not David, sorry. Saul has grieved the Spirit. Saul has quenched the Spirit. I got my two dudes mixed up right there, right? And then eventually the Spirit left him. Now we live in the New Testament. I don't believe the Spirit leaves us once we're truly saved. But I know that we can grieve the Spirit because I've seen me do it. I know sometimes I say no to God and I quench the Spirit. I've seen me do it. And then we wonder why we don't have the power to be enabled to live from day to day. We're no different than Goliath. Or no different than Saul. Saul believed in God. Saul had the spirit at one time. Remember, Saul prophesied. That's why there's the saying, is Saul also with the prophets? But defiance, that's where it leads us. 
And you can be a Christian. You can be baptized. You can be on staff. You can be a lead pastor and be in defiance of the one true God. Second word that comes to my mind is the word surrender. Surrender. Again, it's a word that's been rolling around in my head all week. In fact, it was rolling in around in my head all the way from last week. And it's a, it's, it's a word we Americans don't like. Right? We fight to the death. Because we think we're David. We think that we're good enough or that, you know, if we work hard enough and, you know, if I had time with that sling, I bet you I could do it. I bet you you could too, but I doubt you would and I doubt you'd have had the courage without the Spirit's help. The reason I bring up that word surrender is because that's the opposite of defiance. What's the difference between David and Saul? I think it's this word, or at least the last two. One was living in defiance of God. Remember, Saul only obeyed when he wanted to, and he only obeyed the parts that he wanted to. He never fully surrendered to the Spirit, even though he had the Spirit, the Spirit of God. David, what I see in this picture, is a man who surrendered to God's Spirit. There's nothing in those words that I read that were really about David. His anger isn't that he's been offended, or Saul's been offended, or his brothers have been offended. He's a nobody. He's a guy that spends most of his time in the rear with the gear. He's in the army, but he's not the infantry. That's why his brother was like, oh, did you just come down here to watch the battle, watch us bleed and be wounded and killed? What? I know your wicked heart. And David's like, calm down. What? Now, no, wait, what is the situation? I'm not talking to you. What's the situation again? And then it gets to Saul, and everything in David is about the honor of God and the name of God and the fact that the one true God has been defied and the spirit of God that has rushed on him, he's completely surrendered to it. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't care how good you are with a sling or how good I am with a sling, I'm not going up against that guy. I'm just not. Because he only had five rounds in his magazine. He must have been pretty good. Or he must have had the spirit. He had the spirit. And one little stone went in the sling. And the sling went round and round. Remember that one? And round and round. And round and round. And round and round and round. But that stone was coming at 100 miles an hour. And he went down. Because I believe David surrendered to the Spirit of God. You see, God doesn't overwhelm us. We work with him. There's a responsibility. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with... With the Holy Spirit. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Essentially, it's saying, don't be controlled by something else. Be controlled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if I have a part to play in that, that means being filled with the Spirit is not this magical thing. I'm not going to be one of these heretical preachers and wave my hand or blow COVID on you. That's not how it happens. It's our daily obedience to God. When we say yes to God and no to our flesh. When we choose not to quench the Spirit or grieve the Spirit. Then we're walking filled with the Spirit. We're surrendered to the Spirit. And so this is key. Don't, don't, don't just say, oh, John, we're not theological. So we saw defiance in the story. And we see one who is surrendered in the story. And then we see victory. Then we see victory. And I know that there are people here and that are people watching and people listen that could use a win. You're looking for a win somewhere in your life. Maybe it's with depression. Maybe it's with addiction. Maybe it's in your relationships. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with your parents. Maybe it's with your money. Maybe it's just life in general. Maybe it's trying to survive in 2021. You could use a win. 
Well, you could choose to be defiant, or you can choose to surrender everything to the one true God. Let him fill you by his spirit, and I promise you there's victory. That's what Ephesians chapter 5 is about when it says, do not be drunk with wine because this leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. How do I know that the victory comes? Not because you're good. I've been around long enough to know you're not. And neither am I. But he's good. Did you catch David's words when he was arguing with Saul? The Lord delivered me from the lion and the bear. David didn't say, I'm a really good shot. I can hit white-tailed deer and gut them with my teeth. No. The Lord delivered me from the lions and the bears, and he'll deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the Lord Most High. Even when he was talking to Goliath, what did he say? After all that stuff, I'm going to feed you. Am I a dog? You send a boy. You come at me with a stick. I'm going to kill you and cut off your head and feed you to the birds. It's going to be a mess. David says, no, it's going to be the opposite. Why? Why will there be victory? Because how great David is? No. He says the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. You see, the problem with stories like these is we read them backwards. We know that David won. And we're like, yeah, my son, I'd like to think I had the courage of David. Or you can be a David or I could be a David. Nobody knew before David went out there. Not even David. Now think about the courage. Now think about the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled him, right? That had rushed upon him. It only comes from a surrendered heart. And that takes humility. That takes humility. I'm thinking right now, one of my best friends and uh, a coach friend, he and I coached a team that went all the way to states in soccer. I'm sorry, it's soccer and it's not something cool for you. But little old Buckley had no business being in a state semifinal. And we had to beat not one but two Goliaths to get there. And I remember on that sideline telling them this story. And I told them, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough, you're not fast enough, and you're not skilled enough to beat these next two teams. You're not. Since they were youths, they've been playing this game. But you know what I said to him? If you will humble yourself to not play their way, but to play our way, we have a shot. Defense and goalkeeping. And we made it all the way past the regionals. It took humility. Humility is part of surrender. And some of us will never experience victory. We'll live in defiance because we won't humble ourselves to surrender fully to the Spirit of God. Oh, you're a Christian. You're a Christian, but there'll be no victory. There'll be no wins. Because you still want to look like the world. If they use a javelin, I use a javelin. If they call me something on Facebook, I'm calling them something on Facebook. You come at my people, I come at your people. That's not full of spirit, the Spirit. We don't fight the way they fight with. We're filled with the Spirit. The weapons we fight with are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I probably got them out of order, but self-control. Who makes this possible? The real hero of 1 Samuel 17, Jesus. Jesus is the hero. You know, Jesus was there because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three in one. The three in one. Jesus was there. He empowered David to kill the giant. David didn't win the victory. Jesus did. Jesus did. I don't know what giants you're facing. I don't know where you need a win. But the champion that stands in the gap for us 
is not a human. He's the God-man. I mean, think about those two armies. And here comes the giant. Who will be our champion? Who will be our hero? Who will stand in the gap? Not one that we're to defy, but one that we surrender to. A truer and better David. A truer and better king. He's the one who kills the giants. And that's a promise. And that's what the Bible teaches. So if, if, if you don't know Christ and you're uh, wanting to know him, you can give your life to Christ. You can simply pray a prayer like this. Jesus, save me. And if you mean it, that spirit that was on David that raised Jesus from the dead, that is the spirit of Christ, will rush upon you. If you are a Christian, you can be filled with that same spirit. But it's your choice. You can live in defiance by saying no to God or saying yes to willful sin. Uh, that spirit can be quenched and grieved. But if you choose to live surrendered to the spirit, your life will get completely out of control. But in a really cool way. I promise. I promise. And there's victory. There's victory. You bow your heads with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true. God, I thank you for stories that give us a picture of who you are and what a life surrendered to you can be. God, I thank you that we don't have to have David be the hero of this story because he was a sinful, imperfect man. But I thank you that he was surrendered enough to you and your will and your spirit that we can take a look at the true champion, the Lord God himself. God, I thank you for Jesus the author, the perfecter of our faith. God, I thank you that he stands in the gap for our salvation. God, I pray that you would help us not just to trust him with our eternal life, but that we would trust him with our every day, surrendered completely to him. God, I am praying for revival for this church. That hearts and minds and lives, young and old, will catch on fire for Christ. That apathy and complacency and being comfortable would be blown up, would be decapitated. That your spirit would fill us. God, I pray this for students and young people first, not because they need it most, but because we know in history when they catch on fire, the parents do too. Would you set us ablaze by your spirit so people will walk for miles to watch us burn? It's the name of Jesus Christ that we ask all these things. Church, if you agree, would you say Amen. Amen. God bless you.